it'll be tweakable. I'm not sure Brian's gauge where you turn it all the way up and then there's just a picture of a load of pedestrians with a big circle and a line. <laughs> or something like that. That's not likely to happen. People of the internet, welcome to episode 54 of Bad Voltage. We have a corker of a show uh, for everybody Ooh, today. Uh, what are we going to talk about, Jeremy? One of the things we're going to talk about is what Stuart Langridge thinks of programmers who consider themselves library or framework users and not users of the underlying language. Um... Um, I indeed. didn't understand a word of that. <laughs> and then we will be reviewing the Blue Yeti microphone, a microphone that every single person in Bad Voltage owns. We'll get Jeremy's opinion on how many people your self-driving car should kill and whether it can get away with it. <laughs> Too shit. You can, you can get a good sense of what this show is going to be about. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about um, uh, another example of uh, the UK government's ludicrous laws um, and how Apple are actually a weird bastion for the right side for once. Mm. And now bad voltage. <laughs> I can't believe you've been waiting 50 shows to do that, haven't you? <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to, I was going to leave it at that and say, cut. I was in for the long burn on that one. I'm like, well, not until we hit at least 50 shows Boom. until I do this. And now, bad voltage. Damn it. Jeez, that took a while. <laughs> one of those things where I can't decide whether I'm being curmudgeonly or I'm actually bringing up a serious point, so you have to bear right. with me. All right. We see, we see certainly these days, a lot of people, um, a lot of programmers, this is a very developer-centric topic, right? So those of you who are totally not interested in development stuff are welcome to just switch off. Yeah, skip yeah. The so if segment. you're not a programmer, <laughs> stop listening to the show right now. Just don't even pay attention to the yeah. entire welcome rest of the program. <laughs> welcome to Bad Voltage. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll learn something. Most, most programming languages have uh, various frameworks, libraries, that kind of thing available to them. And increasingly, it feels like we're seeing programmers learn those frameworks, those libraries, and not the underlying thing. So you're seeing a whole bunch of people, there's a running joke in the JavaScript community about how there are too many people who only understand jQuery. There's a, someone's done a very well mocked up Stack Overflow post where someone asked for a jQuery plugin to add two numbers. <laughs> and, there's, right, right. And, and there's one guy going no you just add two numbers by going one plus two and it's been downvoted about nine thousand times when we were going how do i make it work with jquery right but in <laughs> php you've got are uh, you increasingly seeing people using frameworks like laravel and yeah. Again, they're using, they're becoming Laravel programmers. You, you, you try to do something outside the, the auspices of what Laravel can cope with. And they're like, well, I don't really understand how to do that because they're Laravel hackers. They're not <laughs> PHP hackers. Right? <laughs> they're not real the people. Question, right. That, well, right. The, the, no. the, the question is, is this actually a bad thing? Or, I, I mean, I'm assuming that when C came in, you had a whole bunch of grey beardy people sitting about going, oh, but you're doing C, that means you can't individually hack the opcodes like I do in assembly. There's a thing in the back yeah. of the jargon file called the real story of Mel, which is about this kind of thing. So clearly this idea that people are using... Uh, simpler frameworky style stuff rather than properly understanding is not a new complaint no but do you think on no. balance it's better for programmers to to do this to, is is it good in the same way that people don't have to learn long division anymore because we have calculators so why bother or are we seeing increasingly people getting further and further away from the metal, which is why my computer today is not significantly faster than one 20 years ago, because every time hardware people create new faster computers, the software people just go, ah, oh, loads more RAM for me to waste, so nothing gets any better. 
So you, is are the the core of, of, you are the king of the longest intros ever, by the way. Is the, is the core of your question, <laughs> are we supportive of people being stupider now than they were before or stupider than they could be? That, that's basically the gist of it. That, say, that seems like you already have an opinion on the question, <laughs> I've got to say. It, it does sound like that, doesn't it? I think it's a little more nuanced, right? As a new developer, obviously a framework can be a little bit of a siren song because it gets you... You can do a lot and reach a kind of an MVP very quickly without really knowing the language. And that yes. kind of is an encouraging thing, right? It gives you a serious head start to actually get some work done and, and see something happen, which if that keeps you programming, as long as then once you learn the framework, you then move on to other frameworks or learning the language itself, either one. But you got to do one of the two. I think with if you start with a framework and stick with just that framework, to use your <clears throat> example with Laravel, if you become a Laravel developer and don't know PHP and never look at, you know, code igniter or a cake or whatever, a myriad different <laughs> PHP frameworks. And yeah, then that's problematic. But if well, you just use well, it or, as kind of a stepping stone to become a programmer and to keep your interest at the beginning, because a lot of times, especially if you're going from zero to your first programming language, it gets a little frustrating at the beginning. You don't really, especially it's with some languages, you don't see a lot right away. I And I think... Despite my snarkiness, despite my snarkiness at the outset, I got to say, I don't actually see it as actually problematic. I mean, the reality is most people developing most little pieces of software don't really need to be all that low level, don't need to be hardcore elite hackers. They don't they don't need to know much. They're probably just banging out a little tool or putting together a little game or or, or something random like that. So just knowing a, a, a framework around on top of a framework framework on top of another framework on top of an interpreted language that does it for them while yeah that's super not efficient and means that they don't know all that much it gets the job done for them so you know who cares i'm i'm fine with it so you know from my fairly limited experience as being i guess a hobbyist developer one of the things i've noticed is that when you um Invariably, when you use a framework or a library or something like that, you'll, you'll need to do something that will reach the limitations of that framework or that library. Um, so, you know, an example of this might be, for example, consuming an API is that you've got various um, kind of wrappers for either APIs or you've got ways of, s- of simplifying how you engage with APIs. But ultimately, you may just end up basically throwing get and post uh, requests at the server directly. Um, so... My feeling is, you know, you typically tend to, it's okay to use these libraries and these frameworks, but where you need to learn the language more bluntly, you'll probably get there. So I don't really see that big of a deal with it. I mean, right. I, must, I must confess that I, I don't like it when, speaking as a JavaScript guy, right, I don't like it when someone is not only using something like jQuery, but is is solving things in a complex way with jQuery, which is perfectly well solvable without jQuery at all. But that line that I've drawn is almost completely arbitrary because I, I'll get annoyed at a jQuery person and say, hey, well, why aren't you doing proper JavaScript? And then in the next chair, some guy says, well, why don't you use C rather than interpreted language? And I say, what, manage memory myself? Why would I want to do that? That's stupid. So was, completely arbitrary line. That point. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so as long as it's, it's okay to be using an interpreted language sitting in inside of a browser runtime environment that's developed on top of three or four different languages using multiple frameworks on top of the operating system. That's fine. But don't add a framework on that. But no, but no jQuery. And, and I agree. Right. I mean, as, as far as I can tell, in um, I originally postulated the idea for this segment and then sat there and thought about how I felt about it. And it turns out that what I don't like is people working at a higher abstraction la- level than me. Working right. at my level <laughs> is exactly Perfectly where you okay. ought to be. Well, the and other, I am the other, aware, the other impo- I'm aware of... Um, of how arbitrary a location for my feelings this is. Well, the, no. other, the other, I think, an important question to consider here is, who gives a shit? No, <laughs> like, no, 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 what, John, like, what, no. Like, what, like, no, seriously, what? who cares if, if I people... I care, and apparently I, I get, Stuart cares, Welcome to Bad too. Voltage, where we discuss only things nobody gives a shit about. <laughs> right, I get, I mean, I get, I get the intellectual question here, but does anyone really I, actually I, I like think, yeah, a better way to summarize care. this in my opinion is that there's really no single rule right going back to kind of what brian was saying earlier it really depends on the person it depends on their skills it depends on their end goals right do they want to be a professional employed programmer at, at 
Facebook or do they want to throw together a project that, that interests them on the weekend? And depending on the answer to a lot of those different questions, there's wait, really no correct answer. Wait, Jeremy, that sounds really smart. I don't think I said anything that intelligent. I think you're attributing something else to me. That's fantastic, though. <laughs> but seriously, I, I I'll think, take it. I think Stuart, Stuart's right here. So I feel the exact same way as Stuart. I have, you know, in my past life as a developer, I always was like, man, we'll get, get rid of these extra frameworks, get rid of the cruft, get rid of this garbage on top of everything and just get down to the base. But invariably, that base was always some sort of random interpreted language on top of a bunch of other frameworks. And so while was I being a hypocritical bastard about it? Oh, most definitely. And I think all developers do that. I mean, realistically, even C, really? Come on. There's a couple layers between C and that actual metal. Well, so C, C developers are kind of... A high-level uh, language, right? I mean, it was it was the one of the first high-level languages, yeah. really. That was the sellout. Well, no, no, no. no. C, C came later than basic and a bunch of other things. So C's actually not that old school, comparatively, compared to a lot C. of things. I thought C came yeah, no, no, basic was first. Basic, basic came before yeah, but, C, and there's a few other languages exactly before that. The thing there were there would wow. have been people sitting there on a bad voltage ancient edition condemning people for using <laughs> C rather than individually writing assembler in their notebook and then assembling it by hand to go yeah. onto the punch. Yeah, cards, that's right? how you do. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so this, yes. this bad amperage show you speak of sounds terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> bad current. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, obviously, this is kind of an ongoing thing. But the point I tried to make right at the beginning is is an important one. That my computer is not does not feel significantly faster to me yeah. than a machine with ten, one ten thousandth of its power... 20 odd years ago. And yeah, that's because you're running Unity now. In ge- it's not because I'm running Unity. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad Jeremy said that, not me. But I like how Brian say. and Jeremy appear to be blending into each other in this particular <laughs> episode of Bad Vault. Brilliant it minds, is actually my friends. quite worrying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, do, do you not think, you look at something like the Amiga, right? I'm, not, I'm no Amiga partisan, so I'm picking it as an example, but they yeah. had a performant, good OS, which took up almost no space and ran yeah. just as quickly as your oh. Fedora Gnome or Windows 10 desktop or whatever. Oh, And yes. you know they sat there and hacked that whole thing together individu- with individual assembler opcodes. And at no amazing. point was any of it written in Python. It's so- amazing. <laughs> you know, and it's it's not... You're, you're totally right. I mean, if we got back down to a certain lower level, the speed performance we get is just... The speed boost is just incredible. I've been, I've been doing this really stupid really stupid article series over at Network World <laughs> where I where I literally review operating systems that nobody uses, right? And one of them is an open source implementation of the Amiga OS. So it's a new operating system just kind of based on Amiga, right? So fast, it is bonkers. I mean, it boots in like, what, all of a second, maybe two, to a complete GUI, and the GUI is actually modern and and looks as good and has as many features as what we'd expect on Ubuntu 1510, and it's amazing how fast it is and runs in like 30 megs of RAM, 30 megs of RAM, and that's because it's much lower level. It doesn't have all these libraries stacked on top, and it's so crazy fast. Well, it, Stuart's well, right. It depends what, what you're optimizing. For right, I think the Linux desktop is just optimizing for flexibility and what you're giving up there is some yeah. resources. Oh, uh, no, you're, you're right. Uh, you're right. And, but what would and be, there, I mean, there is value in, oper- in, in optimizing at least slightly for developer convenience over user convenience because it means that more apps well, I think can a lot of be it too, written. Especially on the modern Linux desktop, at least from my perspective, is the stupid transitions and other stuff that I don't even want are usually what makes it perform like crap. If you turn that stuff off, it performs way better. It does and it's less annoying. The other opinion. thing as well, I think that would be interesting to, maybe one of our listeners can point us in this direction, but what would be interesting to know is you take something like the Amiga 500 from years back. If you were to look at a program written for the Amiga 500, which was, it'd be interesting to compare a program written to the complexity and the performance requirements of something equivalent today. So, for example, uh, you know, today you've got something like Grand Theft Auto Five, right, which is an enormous code base. But then you're going to end up comparing Wolfenstein and then to very Call of taxi. Duty. I, don't, I don't know that that's yeah, a fair yes. comparison. Yeah. Exactly. But, but something, but what I'm talking about is something that would require a large development team to work together and build something that's really 
that's complicated, not just in terms of the performance usage, but also uh, or the system requirements, but also in terms of putting it together. It'd be interesting to see how they compare because uh, no. it's easy to say it's easy to say the reason why things are slower today is because programs are so much more complicated than they used to be. But I don't know if that's the case. I, I, I'd be inclined. Games are probably not a good comparison here, but comparing a text editor where you have source for some kind of reasonably competent Amiga text editor and some kind yeah. and, and comparing it with something like G edit and saying, okay, can you write plugins for both? And how do you do it? How hard is it to hack a yeah. new feature into this editor, like spell checking or adding a margin at 80. Can you just compare VI like to VI since it probably ran on both? This is kind so of what I'm thinking. The same actual yeah. program. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 just take that an open be... source piece of software that runs on friggin' yeah. everything like like VI or Emacs. See if we can Emacs. get Emacs up and running, and then run a bunch of those. There's benchmark plugins inside of Emacs, so there we go. Let's just run those benchmarks on friggin' just, every system. I just realized, you know, Emacs was always kind of like uh, sneered at as eight megabytes and constantly swapping. It's just uh, just thinking now how completely ludicrous that sneering is like eight <laughs> megabytes really <laughs> it should be like eight gigabytes and constantly swapping but I was gonna say, um, I've, got, I've got half a dozen individual jpegs which are larger than that <laughs> the logo can be big all goat that. related um so we should probably wrap this up a little bit yeah. um so yeah i'd be curious to see if there's anyone out there who's actually got I'd love to know what the actual performance comparison is. So, like, you know, I think the text editor thing is neat because something like Emacs or Vi, you know, at a curses level that doesn't require a ton of, like, frameworks underneath it. But then also it would be interesting to know a text editor written that is running on a bunch of general purpose libraries like gedit and what the comparison will be for the Amiga. So if anyone knows anything about that, let us know in the forum at community.badvoltagedog. Also, jQuery is apparently garbage. I didn't say that. <laughs> a little while ago, um, I needed to buy a travel microphone, and I asked the uh, my three compadres about what to get. And there was a pretty pretty consistent viewpoint on what what we should look at, certainly from Brian, which was a microphone called the Blue Yeti. No, wait, wait. Um, there was is- a consistent viewpoint. From Brian. <laughs> so, so I want to be clear. <laughs> yeah, to be completely fair, I never even heard of the Yeti. I appreciate I started that sentence thinking, I thought we all had them. And then I realized halfway through that sentence, only Brian had one. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, so I asked Brian. Brian said, get a Blue Yeti. It's a great microphone. It's USB powered. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's rugged. You know, it's got a mute button. It just works in Linux and Mac and everything else. Um, it's relatively cost effective, blah, 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 blah. So I bought one and I've absolutely loved it. And it's my, it's not the microphone that I tend to use on most shows, uh, but it's my travel microphone. And then Ak has got one and Jeremy has got one as well. So we thought we'd do a group review of this. So what, what, I mean, I love it, right? It's like I say, I think it's rugged. It's, it's kick-ass, uh, it just works. Um, you so know, I do have I, one complaint on your recommendation, right? So I don't use it for recording most of the shows. I have a Shure SM7 that I just have had for a while. Ooh, the Shure SM7 is nice. I, it's a nice mic, right? So that's yeah. what I use for, for most of the shows. I bought this for, as uh, John recommended it as, a travel mic, right? So that when I travel, I'm not going to pack the SM7's a giant. I don't want to pack that thing. So I ordered the Blue Yeti. I actually got it on sale at Wood. It was only like 65 bucks or something when I got it, which I figured, great deal. We had been talking about it when I saw it. Awesome. So I get this thing, and for a travel mic, it's really not that good because it's one foot big and 74 Weighs pounds. A ton. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> well, it, I'm it sure seems it's like a very well-constructed, a- high-quality, really, really good mic. I don't know that as a travel mic it's going to I'm not sure it's designed to be a travel mic. I, I don't think it is, but that's, that what you, no. that's what you recommended uh, it is. Yeah. Because uh, it is, it weighs... It, it it's got to be four pounds. ...the weight of the unit. No, no. <laughs> so so the, mic, reason, the reason it's nice as a travel mic is that it has its its part, its own stand. It is its own it does stand. It fold in, too. It, so and, and it folds into itself. And so, it, yeah, Jeremy's right. It's about, a, it's about a foot in length and about uh, five inches wide and around. So it, it does take up a fair bit 
bit of space in your luggage or your backpack if you're on the go, but it's not too heavy and you don't need to bring a mixer. You don't need to bring a tube preamp like you do with uh, a lot of the nicer mics. You don't really need to do any of that. And one of the things I really like about it is it's got a microphone jack in it and connects over USB and acts as its own audio device for both input and output. So if you've got um, whatever machine, you can literally roll up to any Linux laptop, desktop, anything that doesn't have a good working sound driver for whatever card it's it's using, plug this sucker in and boom, you've got audio in and out and it works perfectly. And that to me is yeah. really, really handy. And I will say for the price, even the full price I think was one nineteen or something, the yeah. build quality and feature set really is for in that price range, I think unparalleled. I haven't seen well, anything the- close. <laughs> And I, I would actually say the build quality is an important thing. Like as you know, I've been recording music for years and I, I own a lot of microphones and they have a shelf life. Yeah. Um, and I use microphones relatively, I mean, with the exception of the one that I'm talking into right now, which doesn't get moved around very much. It sits on a stand connected to my desk, but with usual microphones, you're constantly jacking them in and out of, of mic stands yeah. and they do die pretty quickly. And this thing is, it is heavy, but it, like Jeremy says, it's built out of fricking Kryptonian. <laughs> is it sturdy? That's not so, um, that's not a thing, by the way. It is now. It, it, is, it is a thing, is. and we shall respect it. It is, it is now. The mi- it is the most durable microphone, kind of Superman. To, uh, to Did you say it's the most durable microphone? Durable microphone, oh, Superman durable, technology. not gerbil microphone, based on <laughs> it's not crypt- a gerbil or whatever gerbil. you said. Yeah. I have to say, one of the things I like about this, because I'm not, I'm not an audio person. It's been made abundantly clear to me in the last decade or so of podcasting you are that I'm not, not allowed to not have opinions person. about audio stuff. So <laughs> yeah, when, yeah. when my old, well, my old microphone didn't seem to, uh, wasn't doing very well. And I had a, it was an XLR mic and I had a Shaw X2U, I think it was called an XLR to USB connector. And it threw a seven in some kind of disastrous way and I needed a new mic. So I said to the guys, recommend me. And everyone went, yeah, well, I've got this Blue Yeti thing and it seems fine, buy that. And because I'm not a microphone person, I'm not an audio person, I don't have mixing desks and stuff, right? And I'm not cool enough to have a travel mic. I just want a microphone. So I bought this. you never travel. (laughs) I bought this. I don't, if I could possibly avoid it. Um, I bought this. I plugged it in and it just works. Didn't it's have to great, do anything, right? didn't have to install software, configure anything. You do Nothing. it, it just pops up as an as yeah. an audio source and you just pick it and you're done. And it's got um uh, one of the nice things about it is you can set how it records. So it can either record sort of omnidirectionally or just pointing towards you, or it can yeah. do a cardioid thing where it records you and the person sitting on the other side of it, but not sounds from the sides of it and stuff like that. And that seems yeah. immensely clever to me. It would definitely be handy at conferences switch. and stuff too to have all those yes. options. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's it's also, if you're doing an interview with someone, you'd only need the one microphone, but you're st- right. and, and you can actually set up if you do that cardioid thing. I believe what it outputs is a stereo signal with you on one of the tracks and them on the other. So yes, you can separate yeah, them into yeah, yeah. It, can, it, get, it gets dual side. I've done this a couple of times. Yeah, you can really. You set the microphone up, set it to that pattern. The, there's just a little knob on the back with the four pattern selector. You set it to that pattern, arrange it so you, one of you is on either side of it. You can be you know up to a couple of feet away so you can be sitting back casual set the microphone so it's pointed straight up and down which is just an in, in the adjustable base it's easy to do and hit record and it's done it's it's so convenient it, and it saves it as two tracks yeah it, it actually records I have a stereo, no idea that it a stereo that. signal when it does that. that yeah it's I don't fantastic think, i don't think it does it's, it's not two separate tracks. It's a no, it's stereo. stereo track it's, with it's your left and right. single stereo signal. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd separate them out into two mono tracks. But yes. it means that you can get two mono tracks out that you can you, edit. You can. You yes. can. Right. But, but more importantly, like you can even just set it to be, you know, omnidirectional, which is even handier because then you can just set it in the middle of a table with several people gathered around it and just start talking. Because, I mean, really, if you're listening to a podcast, you don't give a crap if it's stereo or not. I mean, you want it coming into no. both your ears, Whatever. but it's all end up, it's all kind of mono anyway. So, you know, it, it works just phenomenally well. And doing that, you end up with a better sound than most two or $300 field recorders doing the same thing. So it is a little bulkier than a field recorder, but if you're traveling somewhere and you've got a laptop anyway, it's just, it's a no brainer. 
the sound quality is excellent, and the thing that that I was impressed with when I when I got mine was it's an incredibly sensitive mic. It now, is. You've got to be a bit careful with that because it can eat, be you know if if for example you're a horrible bastard who refuses to buy a pop shield despite multiple <laughs> attempts to ask you to buy a sh- pop shield. Right, <laughs> Stuart. Is, you know, one Brian Hi. Lundu. Not me, <laughs> um, <Landuke. laughs> it, it can be a little sensitive, but um, I mean, you can you can dial that back. But the thing that's nice, as Brian says, is you can put it reasonably far away from the from the subjects and get really good results with with not a lot of background noise. As to, well. to give so you guys an example, just for the people listening, so there's a there's a gain knob on the back, so you can adjust the gain just as if you had like a, a mixer that you were you were sending your signal into. Right now, my knob is turned all the way the frig down. It is bottomed out. And if I start turning it up, well, here, let's see what happens. If I start turning it up, I mean, you start picking up a whole hell of a lot of noise. And right now we're maybe a quarter of the way up the knob. So let's turn that way back down because that was ridiculous. But it's, That was really <laughs> at 25%? Yeah, that was about 25%. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, it gets Jeez. it gets nuts. So, but if you turn it all the way down, you pick up very little room noise, especially if you do more of a a, a unidirectional uh, pattern, which it has on the back. And it's just so handy. I It'd love be interesting this thing. to see, like, to do some performance testing because I know that you know with really high end um, studio mics like the Neumann, like the tube tube powered Neumann mics. Um, one of the problems with those kinds of mics is that they're so sensitive that unless you are inside pretty much a panic room you can hear <laughs> you can hear like traffic traffic you know a mile away it's ludicrous and uh that really is a like proper a, studio mic yeah 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 that's like a two thousand dollar microphone though this is you know this is a, a, a <laughs> hunk of metal from one hundred dollars seventy dollars well, you know it's it, so to, to give people a comparison uh, uh when i used to do an old podcast that shall not be named we we had fairly decent audio for a while but we we had the problem where we had these uh these mxl i think it was 990 microphones and they were great microphones that produced this really warm rich sound but just like john was saying it picked up friggin everything in the room so we had to be in a room filled with curtains and sound dampening material and egg cartons taped to our face with duct tape and all sorts of things just to make it sound halfway <laughs> decent. This thing, I am currently sitting in my living room right now. It, it mostly picks up what's in front of me, and if I have a toddler in the other room making some noise, you usually can't hear her unless she's really, really mad at daddy. So that's she's not too bad. For it, yeah. yeah. So, overall, 100 bucks. So I quite like it. Yeah. Well, so what's Will the bad vintage verdict? Oh, come on. It's brilliant. Everyone already knows. It's awesome. Buy one. There we go. Get one. Get one. On, and also, we're not sponsored by these people. It sounded by Blue. Was the biggest Perhaps, hand wavy. What is this, episode 54? Gear. Perhaps episode 55 will be sponsored by Blue. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Blue Microphones, people, we love your gear. And were we to receive a bunch of Blue Microphones t shirts or something, we'd probably wear them. <laughs> So depending on where in the world you live, you have probably seen some self-driving cars already cruising around. Before, I think they can become a widespread mainstream thing that you see day to day and can just go by. Car makers are going to have to solve a very difficult ethical dilemma, really based on, uh, let's go with uh, algorithmic morality, right? And that is, how should the car be programmed in the event of an unavoidable accident? Should it minimize the loss of life, even if that means sacrificing the owner, who's the, probably the occupant? Should it protect the occupant at all costs? Should it choose at random? Right, and so uh, I'll lay a kind of a s- scenario off for you guys, and uh, we can discuss the I can tell Brian really likes algorithmic I'm, I'm already thinking, I love the idea of it choosing at random. It's just, it's like, <laughs> you're playing the life lottery. Let's just say you're, you're driving down your autonomous car in the not too distant future and uh, you're driving, let's say, along a cliff and five people, for whatever reason, this is obviously a very contrived example, but five people come out of nowhere and in front of the car and the car has to make a decision. Should it barrel over these five people going 70 miles an hour, which will almost certainly kill all five, or should it drive off the cliff only killing you? Right. So with the decision like that on the table, where do you think this is going to go? And should it be regulated? Should it be law? Should it be up to the manufacturers? Should it be a setting on the car and up to the individual driver? I think we should protect all cars. Uh, sorry, we should make all cars 
programmed so they protect me specifically. Uh, everyone else, yeah. suck yeah. it up, dudes. It's just uh, it's price you pay. Uh, I don't know. O- I mean, OCP Directive they, Four protect biggest <laughs> law of autonomous vehicles. Yeah, directive Four. Um, it's difficult, isn't it? Because there's, I mean, this is one of those things where there's really no right answer, and it's just making the best of a bad decision. I mean, in your example, Jeremy, my gut feeling would be to save the lives of the five people that, you know, if you can set the, the more life that can be saved is probably so, the better. And outcome. there's a ton of weird unintended consequences here. So if you, if the car is automatically programmed to kill the occupant in that case, will less autonomous cars be sold and then more people die as a result of there being less what? autonomous cars? Because it's clear if? autonomous cars are safer. What if the car goes over the cliff, saving the four or five people that was were standing next to the cliff edge, but at the bottom of that cliff was a group of orphans on a field trip from their orphanage, and the car is going <laughs> to smash into them? I guess uh, but, then again, but then mode. again, what if the car drives right? over the cliff, and at the bottom of the cliff, there's a really big trampoline? <laughs> Hits the trampoline, this, bounces this back up, lands on the five people anyway, and um, all the people die. It does. I, I'm not. I have to say, I'm not sure <laughs> which direction we should go and whether we should, you know, protect the occupant at all costs or minimize loss of life or whatever. This is a freaking hard does, question. But it does yeah. seem to be very much like this is an area where we need regulation because. It feels like whatever we pick, everything has to implement the same algorithm. Because otherwise, if if manufacturers are allowed to choose, then some manufacturers will choose protect the occupant at all costs, and some manufacturers will choose kill the occupant if it's important, at which point everyone buys the one that protects them. Yeah, Yeah, I'm totally buying that one. So it it, it entirely feels like... There's unintended consequences either way, because if it's always programmed to avoid, you know at some point some jerk's going to jump out in front of the car on purpose just to see what happens, and it's going to end up killing the guy just because someone was being a jerk well well also interesting question you raised there ak is if you were faced with you know uh, different cars that save different groups would you buy the car that would kill other people as opposed to kill yourself i already buy a car that will kill other people rather than myself well, that's what but my point is, is that if, if you are. knew if you knew yeah. if, like put it this way if i if there was a particular car on the market the tesla whatever um and I knew that it was going to, at all costs, protect myself, potentially at the risk of killing other people. Like, if it was faced between a decision between killing somebody else or two more people or two two or more people than myself, I don't think I could live with myself if that but, actually happened. Uh, really? But that, I mean, you can. that means your only decision is being suicidal or a psychopath, and that no, means I just wouldn't buy it either. I, I, That's a I weird decision know. to have to yeah, Stuart made a really good point. That's the environment we have today. When we're driving around in our cars, the outside of our cars aren't filled with airbags and springs and and cool things to help other people not get hurt. They're filled with airbags on the insides and crumple now, zones now and whatnot, is, so we um, don't die. To yeah. to 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 slightly uh, reverse correct Brian's point. Cars are now the Euro don't NCAT reverse rating. Correct me. Right, I don't even the, know what that means when you the, say reverse correct. The, Euro, the Euro say NCAT correct or ratings. not correct? Are you going to prove me wrong or correct me? <laughs> He's going to oh, say wait, it backwards. That's the same thing. He's going to prove you wrong. Question. He's going to correct you in reverse. <laughs> the Euro NCAP ratings were originally designed to uh, to indicate the safety of passengers and the driver of the car. And the top yeah. rating was five, and they assumed basically no cars would get to it. Now, essentially, all cars are at it, and they've switched to rating cars based on the safety of a passenger, of a pedestrian that you hit. And cars are competing on that, so really? that is good. Yes. I didn't but, even know that. Well, but, but, doesn't but, the it, smart car automatically win because it weighs 11 pounds and isn't capable of hurting a pedestrian? Yeah, it just b- it bounces measure. off a child. <laughs> yeah, that's a weird thing to measure. I, am, I admit it there's only so much you can do by calculating a slightly different angle for the bonnet or whatever but nonetheless there is something there but Jono are you honestly in a position given your non-self-driving car at the moment if it's hurtling towards the cliff and it's going to hit those five people are you honestly telling me you drive off the cliff to save them well, because uh, I mean, if you say honestly, yes, I would. I don't believe. You. Well, honestly, <laughs> in, in a situation, in a, we're comparing apples and oranges because the decision that a human makes in that moment, in that in that split second, yeah, I probably would save myself. I'm not going to deny that. What we're talking about is choosing a machine and the decisions that the machine will make. Right? Yes. Today, right. we, you know, what we have today is, you know, I. Like Brian says, I'm fundamentally protected when I'm in my car. The outside world isn't protected. But we're 
we're comparing two different things. But this creates a weird paradox, right? That mm. means people in general, I think, are going to be in favor of cars that sacrifice the occupant to save other people as long as they are not the occupant. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's exactly. what I like. Yeah. So, um, that, that, I mean, what people would actually like, being completely serious as a policy, is exactly what John proposed right at the beginning, Directive 4. Protect me at all costs. If I'm the pedestrian, kill the occupant. If I'm driving the car, kill pedestrians, right? That's what people yeah. want. I don't think people would want that, though. <coughs> I don't know. I, I, have a I don't think people would admit they want it, which is not the same thing as not wanting it. That's, that's, that's true. I mean, but... Also, let's be honest, we're not going to get to a point... I'd, I'd be very surprised if we get to a point where, you know, when you go into your Mercedes dealership, you know, where yeah. one of the big shiny features of this car is, it'll protect you and kill all of those children. Yeah. Uh, so what if this doesn't I, So what if this doesn't have to be a binary decision either? What if there is a situation where it can say, I can kill the five people or drive off the cliff, or I can try to do something with a probability of a non-zero probability of killing everyone involved, but you, a non-zero probability of not killing anybody. Are yeah. you suggesting that it has a cool little dash feature where you can set it to different modes, like you put no, it no, in no, turbo mode it, nowadays, but now it's murder is, mode or something like that? What if the best decision is neither A or B, but a blend of both? And, that, and that's the point. You can have these things that's calculate almost, probabilities. I don't think it'll be tweakable. I'm not sure Brian's gauge where you turn it all the way up and then there's just a picture of a load of pedestrians with a big circle and a line <laughs> Or something like that. That's not likely to happen. What happens but, when people mod it as well? Like, but, I, I want to switch on anti ginger mode, for example. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I was thinking if, if the cars can scan the people you're about to hit and determine if they're douchebags or not, well, that's going to change, you know, what the car does. No hipsters are left on the planet, like, within a week of these cars going on sale. But, um, uh, but for this, we have to look to the work of noted ethical philosopher Will Smith in the film I, Robot. Right? There's, a, there's a scene in that film where he's talking We're about We're going how to the film he, version of I, of I, Robot. I am going to the film version of I, Robot. Yes, yes, I Isn't am. That one it's of those right up there with Nick and McKee and Ethics by Aristotle. Seriously, it's amazing. Um, there's uh, oh. there's a, a bit in that film where he hates robots, and it turns out the reason he hates robots is because the robot saved his life in a, by diving into a river and pulling him out after a car crash, but it should right. have saved the little girl who was in the other car. And it right. didn't because it calculated that he had a 45% chance of survival. The girl had an 11% chance of survival. But Will Smith felt, uh, with a certain amount of recognition from the audience, I think, that you should have saved the yep. little girl because she's a little girl, even though mm. it's less likely. And 11% is enough. A human would have known that is the line. Yes, it right. absolutely is. Sounds like she was a douchebag, though. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's possible that she wasn't Jono, and that's why she was disregarded. Hey, I'm not sure. Hey, that wasn't necessary. That wasn't... Ne well, maybe necessary, because I just called 11 year old douchebag. Low. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> jokingly, yeah, I mean, I'll admit. The, but I think the larger part of the problem here is not really what we do about this. It's... People get very resentful at the idea... That you should that you can boil this sort of thing down to mathematical probability. It's like you yeah. know what's the what's the value of a human life? And everybody, oh well, the value is infinite. You can't put a dollar value on life. But then, how much money are you prepared to spend to save an individual life? And right, but before these become mainstream, fitting. this is right. something that has to be answered. Right? This yes. isn't something we can figure out afterwards. So I, it, I think yeah. this is probably my guess going to be the biggest hurdle to yeah. Autonomous cars being improved at a mainstream scale is this question, and it, it's a question that's really. How would you like to be the programmer that programs it into cars? Oh, oh my god! <laughs> and then, and then right. six, and months, then six months, months later, thing. you go, "Oh shit! I put a minus there, and it was meant to be a plus. That's not good." <laughs> right. I mean, I, so I now actually, people are dead. I actually don't think this is going to be one of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks for aut autonomous cars. I think what's going to happen is. The discussion around this thing, I think, I think a lot. I think there will be um, a, an evolved consensus around what the best of a bad situation should be within the automotive world. I think what the what the consumers are going to worry about is people hacking these cars and then changing that logic. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that could arguably become. I think some people will think that this is going to be a new form of terrorism. Is that you know from a keyboard in uh, you know in another part of the world, you can basically upload an exploit that will essentially you know, wipe out a ton of people in a populated area. Um, right. Yeah, you can, you can imagine a kind of a guerrilla action being done by the anti- anti-self-driving cars coalition where yeah. they tweak it so it 100% protects pedestrians at the expense of the occupant or something. Right. right. You know, the other thing here, too, is liability, right? If an autonomous car kills someone, who's liable from an insurance perspective? Is it the driver? Is it the 
manufacturer of the car? Is it the maker is it of the, the programmer? Is it? <gasps> it's the QA guy. It's the testers that right. did a I mean, bad <laughs> job finding that bug. That's another Seriously. thing that insurance companies, I'm sure, are going to want sorted out very explicitly before they're going to start that's insuring That's actually a really good cars. point, yeah. Because, I mean, it's hard to to justify the idea that the driver, in quotes, is responsible because the whole point of the car is that you're not driving it. But equally, if you say, right. okay, Ford, if this car kills anybody, you are liable. No one will put a self-driving car on sale. Nobody. Right. No one. Yeah. Maybe we need to go all Thunderdome. And just go Mad Max style and just like put like weapons and flamethrowers and crap on the outside of all cars and just abolish laws. <laughs> like the guy at the Live Voltage suggested. Get yes. rid of all laws. <laughs> that he so, yeah. That's how we solve our problems. No, guy at Live Voltage. No. <laughs> We've seen in the past, and right now this moment, a whole bunch of governments come out against the idea of ordinary people being able to use encryption, end-to-end encryption, things like that. We had the clipper chip stuff from the US um, some years ago, the bans on export of encryption. The UK government have started making noises about how encryption is a terrible thing and terrorists use it and what have you. And a question came up during discussions, which was this. Imagine, say, take the UK government as an example. Say, we're, we're going to ban end-to-end encryption because we don't think you should be able to keep secrets from the government. And then Apple, who have repeatedly dedicated a reasonable dedication to their customers' privacy by doing things like encrypting iMessages end-to-end and what have you, they say, if you do that, we will no longer be able to guarantee the privacy of our customers, so we're going to pull out of the UK. We're going to stop selling iPhones here, right? which would be a major league kind of move. So there were two questions there. The first one is, if they threatened that, who would blink first? Well, <laughs> hang on. Be- before we even get to that, I just want to highlight one small point here. Since I've moved to America, Mr. Langridge has given me a certain amount of, bu- of, of, of abuse about the thoughts and perspectives of the American government. And this is a man coming from a country with CCTV everywhere who's trying to ban encryption. Didn't they try this like three years ago? What is going on? Yeah, they did. Uh, th- this, is, this is the same thing as three years ago. Everyone right, came out a- against it and it sort of died back, but apparently it didn't die back all the way and now it's coming gotcha. back again. Can yes, you, I, it's can terrible. You give us I didn't a- vote for them. Yes, I agree with you. But Just before we get onto the, onto the, the question in mind, can you just give us a 30-second summary of what the government, why they want to end encryption? It's, For those people who are unfamiliar with this, which is me. Essentially, this is a this is a waving a flag with the word terrorism written on it. Um, we've the 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 UK government. There's, the, there's been no real proper proposal of this is what a law would look like yet. But there's been a bunch of public comments around. Well. Encryption is, it, it's it, it's bad because then the security services can't get at the information that they need. It helps terrorists communicate and okay. so on. It feels like they're softening up the beachhead for proposing various laws. And this, all this ties into a whole bunch of stuff like, you know, TTIP is um, right, out yeah. there attempting to stop people using open source software in government and things like that across the world and that kind sure. of thing. The, but, the weird thing about this is it seems like we fought this battle, right? I'm sure you guys remember, the, for lack of a better word, the crypto wars of like the late 19. 1990- 90s yeah, with Phil Zimmerman yeah, and PGP exactly. and all that. So it sure looks like this is turning into kind of Crypto Wars 2 yes. the Fed Strikes Back. Oh, which it is, is totally. bizarre to me. Like, it, we won this already and now we're going through and it we've, all. We've and learned we've nothing a, and we're going through it again. And now, we've got, a, and now we've got to fight it again. Hence discussion in the last show about maybe we should start pushing for laws. But the thing I thought was interesting about this is not particularly that the, that the UK government are doing this or whatever. Yes, we don't want to have to fight the Crypto Wars 2. But at this point, we have at least some large companies potentially on our side here. Yeah. Apple is a good example of this. Google have, to some extent, done the same thing, where they've said protecting the security. I, of I think in your specific users, example, the UK blinks first. Is is paramount. So yeah. if the UK say we're going to do this, and then Apple go, we're going to stop selling iPhones and iPads, and we're going to completely pull out the UK market, which is not only a monetary blow, but it's a very big, very public, very visible. Essentially, vote of no confidence by by the world's richest corporation in the UK government. Do the government then go? Oh well, we're just going to abandon it then? Because I mean, on the one hand, you'd like them to do that. On the I other hand, saying to. we've got, I think fun, the amount we've got of pushback f- if you couldn't buy an iPhone, you couldn't buy an in iPhone the UK because of would be policies. too great. I, I think they would. Whoever went against it would immediately get it elected, and the bill would be repealed or whatever you guys call them in the UK very yes. quickly. Yeah. 
the, so the, the, then the, we have the, the, then we have a that but that leads on to a second question, which is that Apple, much as they are you know the richest company in the world and everything, they basically make consumer electronics. Is it a good idea that they have enough power to sway the <laughs> oh views of governments? Yeah. Well, yeah. that's just that's so, just business, isn't it? I just did a did a quick a quick uh, uh, duck duck go search on this one, and uh, so the GDP of the United Kingdom is just shy of three trillion dollars. The net worth of Apple is uh, is significantly over seven hundred billion, which means the the Apple net worth uh, is is between a third and a quarter of the entire GDP of the whole of the United Kingdom, which means, yeah, the United Kingdom definitely blinks first. Um, but also that Apple is freaking scary in that they have that sort of power to make the United Kingdom blink first, which I want them to do because the United Kingdom is wrong. But then it also freaks me out at the same time, which means right, that's a I'm going to hide underneath company. my blanket for a while. I think that's that's pretty much the yeah. gist of it. The thing that's I mean, weird that I don't yeah. get why – I guess politicians aren't necessarily technical, but I think it's obvious that what they basically want is a full bl- carte blanche cryptographic backdoor, which would immediately be the number one global target for cyber criminals everywhere. Yes. Right? Yeah. Immediately. So that they don't get that what they're doing, while maybe well-intentioned from their wrong perspective, is still not asinine. I just don't understand the, the logic. I don't necessarily yeah. know that it's well intentioned. I, I, I see I think no from evidence their perspective that it is. it is. I I don't think that it is. I don't expect anyone of the four of us to think that it is. But I think some of the people on I that end do this. I really think it is. I really, really hate to bring up the words I'm about to bring up. But was oh, Hitler well intentioned? No. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I know, I know it's an extreme there. example, but... Doesn't happen very often in Bad Voltage, but it no, just No, I was going to say, is that, the first, is that the first Godwin in Bad Voltage? I know, I it know, I really hate to do that, but I think it applies because an example of a government or set of leaders and governments doing something that, at the time, a lot of people pointed to and said, well-intentioned, and people did do that back then. Now, granted, it's a whole different topic, a whole different thing, and a whole different caliber, uh, but, but I feel like the example still applies yeah, i don't that's i don't see any analogy. i don't see that there's any proof that the people proposing this have the citizens best interests at heart there's no there's no well, evidence of that yeah but irrespective of what i mean we'll never know what the intentions are and it's easy to see ill will but it's also easy to be a little too optimistic about it right yes. this is again this is again one of those things where there really is no good answer because uh my view well, here is there is a good answer if you, there should be if, if a good you, answer back doors yeah. well, yeah. well no what i'm saying is that um from the government's perspective on one hand if you basically have incredibly strong encryption uh, available to everybody i can see why they would think well hang on a second that's going to get into the hands of terrorists and it's going to be more difficult for us to do our job of preventing terrorism and all the rest of it however on the other hand to jeremy's point if you basically want to backdoor into everything then that is going to be the thing that's going to be exploited and and you can't have the option of people not going out and being able to buy iPhones so there is basically no good option here i, I can see the argument for from the government's perspective but it's it's just it, there's no practical way of of doing it i mean there's no practical way of of having encryption be controlled because that's just not how the way the world works yeah that's not how it works right well the, you see there is um a slight change because obviously this would uh, affect all sorts of uh, online communication stuff. And if they said, "Well, um, now you can't use SSL," uh, most people, I don't, I think, wouldn't properly grasp why that was a problem. Um, you can't buy an iPhone. Hmm. Absolutely, obviously, that is seen as a problem. But I wonder where the line is, like, because this would affect WhatsApp just as much. And WhatsApp are huge. Hundreds yeah. of millions of people use it, right? But if WhatsApp said, "We'll pull out of the UK." Would people dislike that as much? Well, would, would, the would, is, would the UK uh, government blink at that point? Because there's then no big monetary cost. We're not seeing Apple stores disappear and a big chunk no, drop out. Of, no, the, the only um, thing they no, care I about is, is money and backlash. Yeah, the thing. The, well, the thing is as well is is it only Apple, Apple who can I, save us? I here? would say that. No, no Apple I mean Google first, could do the Apple same thing. thing. Microsoft, Microsoft could too. 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 Yeah, there's there's a lot Apple of companies. The first that could. company that's. Apple are the first company that's going out here and making a public statement about it. If you think about all the companies that use encryption, yeah. I mean, think about all the banks, all the all the web services, everything. Everyone's going to be affected by this. So I think Apple are just getting ahead of the curve. Uh, no, in my mind, the thing... 
um, there are there are not that many companies who have taken a public stance and said, no, what we're going to do here is we're protecting our customers privacy but I and think, security uh, don't, google, yeah, but google don't for get example the wrong idea about said, apple apple does not care in my opinion about the privacy of their consumers what they're doing is playing on people's fears of google to sell more apple products yeah. oh, no, I, think I, what they do, I think i think that's I, I think that's unfair i think they do care precisely because people like it and there is no cost to them in doing so it is absolutely a stick to beat google with but google cannot compete on this playing field because their whole business right, but that's model why revolves around that if, that, google cannot yeah. compete on Jer- that, jeremy's that totally right if i was working in apple marketing right now considering all of the horrible security breaches that apple has had over the last several years that have been just astoundingly public almost to the point of making apple security a joke on mainstream news and media um if i can, if i would say hey yeah let's come out against the uk let's take this firm crazy stance that's going to get a huge amount of press that the uk will never ever make us you know follow through on because then it doesn't cost us anything but we'll get us more positive press about how great we are at security than anything else so i i would absolutely do this just as a marketing ploy and that's that's what apple's sure. doing i'm sure of it yep. See, you know, the thing that really surprises me here, I think, and maybe this is just because a lot of governments are, are not very savvy when it comes to technology, is um, I'm surprised that they're focusing on general encryption, which is a ludicrous prospect in the scheme of things. Yeah. Um, because you're trying to boil the ocean, basically. Um, whereas I'm surprised they're not focusing on quantum computing and restricting quantum computing. Because as soon as we have... I mean, there's already... Um, significant work going on in the field of quantum computing and quantum computers being able to uh, crack um, crack encryption Ooh. and I'm surprised that the government is not explicitly focused on the, on that field or even investing in that field because then essentially you can let the world have regular encryption but then you've got the tools that you need. Why would you assume that they're not already working on that? That yeah. seems like be, a naive assumption. But I'm if I was the government, I'm, I'm, I would be working on it big time and not tell a soul if I could keep it secret. Well, very probably, but I'm surprised that they're going out publicly with this horse and pony show about existing encryption, as opposed to thinking, you well, know what, that's ludicrous. Let's just focus on the quantum side dude, of things, dude, and then we'll be dude, okay. Dude, people friggin' love ponies. I, I want to say, I think, I think <laughs> to kind of to kind of sum this up, there really seems to be only one answer to this, and and it's and it's a hard pill to swallow. But I think we need to go full. Thunderdome, go Mad Max style, and probably get rid of of all laws, and uh, and I think that would really take care of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, think this, I think this does bring up a more interesting to me uh, kind of topic, and I, I don't know, John was probably might be interested in this because he's been getting into the behavioral economics things. But I think it would behoove people in general, and I feel like I say every show, people should be more interested in privacy. I wouldn't say it again, but I think people should start thinking about privacy and security and encryption and all those kind of things really as a cost function rather than a bullying condition, right? It's not, are you safe or unsafe? Because it would be yep. my contention that if the NSA is targeting you as a specific person, there is literally non-hyperbolically nothing you can do to stop them. They have far too many resources, far too much technology. Yes. If they're after you, they'll intercept the shipment of your iPhone, sh- put a custom yeah. ASIC in it or whatever it is. So, But if we look at in general, looking at it as a cost function, you can say, how does this measure increase the marginal cost per person being surveilled so that dragnets are not possible? If they're targeting Stuart Langridge, you're screwed. Yeah. But I would like it to be that mass surveillance is so cost prohibitive that it's just yeah. not possible or economically viable, in which case... I, they're going to target individuals. You're not going to stop that realistically. So I, I, don't know, I, I agree, it's but there's a huge ending. positive externality here that requires everyone to do it, even though yeah. you individually don't get the benefit unless everyone else does it as well. And that, it's like the BitTorrent protocol. It, it massively incentivizes leeches, right? For exactly it, that it, reason. Right, but that's a different thing. And I'm not even talking about if more people cared and Apple does it and then Google has to do it to compete and then Microsoft has to do it to compete because most people own products by those people, everyone benefits. Well, right? we've been Only saying the big yeah, players have to do it. Yeah, but and that's we've been the reason saying why... Sh- go on. I was just going to say, we've been saying on Bad Voltage since the beginning that we think that this is what's going to happen, that privacy is going to become something that people are going to have to start competing. Whoever, whoever gets good. it right will define the next 10 years of technology. Right. Thunderdome. And 
that brings us to the end of this Thunderdome-infused episode of Bad Voltage. I would like to thank everyone for hanging out with the four coolest dudes on the internet for the last yeah. hour-ish or so. But the, before, There was a lot of Thunderdome in this episode. There was a yeah, lot of Thunderdome. And, Specifically, uh, there was a lot of Thunderdome from Brian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, it might have been a little premeditated. No one can know for sure. I think we should end by talking about something cool. Uh, Stuart, do you know of anything cool that we can tell people about? Uh, is there anything cool at any specific time? Sort of what? Well, Mid-January-ish sort of thing? Or? A- end, end of January, but nice try. Let's go back over to Jeremy now because Stuart is worthless. Jeremy, is there anything cool <laughs> I, happening I was gonna at guess the end of January? You went to Stuart, I was going to say, is there some kind of sausage con going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's pronounced sausage. Sausage. <laughs> is that what the S anyway. stands for? Oh, wow. <laughs> No, of course we're talking about... uh, What are we talking about, Jono? Put us out of our misery. (laughs) Yeah. Are we talking about scale, maybe? I think we're talking about scale. And more to the point, we're going to be there again. Last year, at scale, we did our first ever live show. We called it Live Voltage. Some people called it Bad Voltage Live. I don't really care what you call it. You could call it Fuzzy Bunny Slippers. Either way, it was frigging rad. And it was an off-the-charts crazy extravaganza of awesomeness. And it it happened at scale, and it's happening again this year. And I believe we... Do we have the specific day and time that it's going down, Jono? So, scale is from the 21st to the 24th. before we go any further, the 21st in the evening <laughs> is me, <laughs> uh, Brian Lundug, the featured, a featured speaker at scale, uh, doing my Linux X presentation, and yep, it is going to be insane. What's happening the next day? Um, after up, the Brian Lundug chill. ego show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the following day, um, which I believe will be the 22nd, I think it's the, I think it's, I believe we're, we're going to be on on the Friday night. I think so. Um, nice. scale. That is, uh, we'll, I believe. We'll right. have everything up um, uh, fairly soon on badvoltage.org slash live. You'll be able to find all the details. And um, there's also going to be a discount code if you go into scale as well, where you can get a discount. I believe it's going to be B Vault again. Um, <clears throat> and it's going to be a rocking show. I just want to say oh, yeah. before we go on, big thank you to our friends at Linode who are going to be sponsoring the show. Um, yes. Not only sponsoring the show in terms of getting us out together to be in the same room, but also there's going to be beer as well. There's going to be free beer uh, for everybody uh, at the beginning of the show. So it's going to be an absolute blast. It's going to be on Friday evening at Scale, and we can't wait to it. And obviously, big thank you to our friends at Scale, Alan Rabinovich and Gareth Greenaway and various other people for, for welcoming us back. So, Yep. Um, we, we All the other people recommend- in, at Scale yeah, have just been relegated to other people's status. They're, they're like the <laughs> professor and Marianne in first episode We're, in the first season of Gilgan's <laughs> Well, we're do, like, sorry, we're sorry. You want me to include people. like Phil in that list? Absolutely not. <laughs> we would massively recommend that you go to scale, even if Live Voltage wasn't going to be there. You should go to scale yes. because it's excellent. But now you have a reason to go to scale. Come and see us. <laughs> you know, yeah, it makes it's, sense. Uh, it really, I mean, uh, anyone who's listened to this show for a long time will be very familiar with how much we love scale. I mean, yeah. And part of the reason why we do Bad Voltage at Scale is not just because, like, they're the only conference that's inviting us to go there. <laughs> it's because we want to <laughs> do it there. To be like, clear, we, they're not the only we, conference we love that's inviting right us. <laughs> we're we're so, not uh, the yeah, total so. pariahs of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Be sure to get along. It's going to be an absolute blast. And obviously, we'll be talking about it a bunch between now and then. We will. Um, uh, Call for Papers is closed at scale. Um, but if it's anything like every other every other year, it's going to be an awesome it's going to be amazing. talks yeah. as well. So, 21st set. to the 24th of January in Los Angeles. Yes, it's going to be glorious. Is there anything it's actually, it's actually in Pasadena, Pasadena. Year, correct? Yeah, they it's in Pasadena yeah. at the Pasadena Civic Center area, which is where uh, the, I believe it's the Emmys used to be held. No, it's not the Emmys. The Grammys? It was the Emmys. Emmys. Yes, Emmys. yes. Yeah. It was the Emmys used to be held there at the at the Civic Auditorium there in Pasadena, which is which is where this is all, all happening around. We're so that's, that's kind of cool. <clears throat> it should be noted, according to Ilan, going to be in quite a big room. So yes. um, we'd you appreciate guys are be if you in could my help room. us fill it. So, so on Thursday, it, it, so my understanding is like, we're talking like 800, 900 seat, uh, uh, big grand ballroom here. So I'll be there on Thursday and then we'll be there on with bad voltage oh, will you be on there, Friday. Brian? Will you I be think there? I'll be there. Yeah. I think I have something on my oh, schedule really? that day. Are you going to be there, Brian? I think I am. <laughs> So, so yeah, we, we need to get this jam packed. I don't think it's going to yes. be a problem, but 
just the same. Get there. Tell people yes. about it. And when you do get there, get there early so you can get good seats because we're talking about an 800 seat ballroom, which means if you're there late, you're going to get stuck in that crappy seat in the far back corner, far away from the stage and far away from the beer. So get there early. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It will be difficult for Brian to do his talk if he gets accidentally run over by my self driving car for going on about it all the time. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it's going to be like a little remote control buggy. We can't put him in charge, but last time we put him in charge of a drivable device, he drove it into a wall. I was just going to say, we've all seen how Brian and robots get along, so let's maybe not do that. I, I am pretty bad at that crap. <laughs> In his right. defense, though, he was driving it across the world. I mean, <laughs> he was literally controlling it from a different, con- different it's continent. It's pretty lucky so. that I didn't kill anyone. So that's pretty cool. I should be getting a <laughs> pat on the back right now. Yeah. You, we, we, you guys I'm sure are you can mean provide to that. me right now, man. I'm sure you can provide that pat on the back yourself. Uh, you guys are so. <laughs> wicked, wicked mean. If you guys think that my co-hosts are mean to me, go to community.badvoltage.org and just kind of let them know. Let them know how mean they are to me and how it hurts not only my feelings, but it makes you feel uncomfortable just I listening you're gonna to say, the show. On the other hand, if you, think, say, if you think that we're justifiably mean, no, Brian, damn it. No, go, to, go, go to google.com and do any search you like. Oh, damn it. Uh, we, we, right. we, we, we're, only, we're only joking, Brian. Don't get upset. Uh-huh. We love you. Uh-huh. We think you're brilliant. Yeah, and, yeah. Lots and we will love. be there on your Thursday night, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you guys, you guys, you guys want to do a competition? You guys want to see the, yeah. what, uh, which video gets more views, the Thursday night or the Friday night one? Oh, damn, uh, well, right there. Yeah, but you're, you're basically, I mean, you are aware that one of the most popular shows on TV is Keeping Up With The Kardashians. That's Hell yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> that shit is tight. I'm just waiting for a reality TV show with Brian Lunduke in it. Keep, keeping Up With The Lundukes. Dude, no, 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 no. There can't it's be anyone like else in the show but me. You just sat on your computer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just sat on your computer, dog. Feverishly searching yourself on Google. Um, <laughs> right there would be some Thunderdome quality shit. All right, that is the end All of this right. episode of Bad Voltage. Thank you again, everybody, and goodbye. Bye. <laughs> you fucker. Thank you.